of Combat Corner. This is your boy, Rudy Rodriguez Showmont, Dana White's favorite podcaster. That's right. He acknowledged me before we had 500 subscribers. So we're doing something right. We are here to talk about UFC 303, International Fight Week, baby. That's right, man. I tell you what, UFC 303 has had a roller coaster to get to where we are this Saturday. It's rather remarkable what the UFC did to make this card worth watching. Because for a minute, you didn't really know what the hell was going to happen. First, it was Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler. Then it was, we don't know. Then it was Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler again. And then we see a purple toe. Conor McGregor is out. Michael Chandler is not fighting because he has no one else to fight besides McGregor. He's been waiting for two years for this fight. And guess who steps in? The savior of the UFC. That's right, Alex Pereira Poetan, who happens to be coming into this fight with two broken toes. Like, you can't make this shit up. Much props to Poetan Alex Pereira. He's coming off of a huge, convincing knockout of Jamal Hill, who was supposed to be on this card, but... The rumors were floating around that he got off the card because Conor McGregor fell off the card. Who knows? I don't care. But Poetan is defending his belt versus Yidi Prohatska. This is a rematch from their first fight that Poetan won. It's a great fight. It's a fight we all wanted to see. But we have to really keep it in perspective. Both of these men have taken this fight on just a few weeks' notice. You don't typically want to have a title fight on a few weeks' notice. But that is the case now. Those guys are ultra professional. They are stepping in. I hope they're in some kind of shape. I know they both fought at UFC 300. Both of them came away with wins, obviously, because that's why they're fighting. This fight probably should have been booked on Sunday after that fight, but it wasn't. I hope they're in shape, realistically. I hope they're in shape. I hope they give us a banger. Um, this This comes down to if Yuri can take Alex to the ground. It's really what is this? This really what this will be about. Can he take Alex down? And can he hold him there? Because I think we've all learned that it doesn't matter if you really can take him down. It matters if you can hold him there. Because when he gets up, he has that lightning in a bottle power, and he'll put your lights out in a blink. It doesn't matter if you kick him in the nuts. He will put your lights and he'll tell Herb Dean to... uh -uh. Uh, uh, got end of the fight. Let's go. This is a hell of an exciting fight. Nonetheless, I, I love the fight. I wish we were going to see it with real notice. It was a fight you could have really, truly promoted. Unfortunately, they didn't have that. But, I mean, they must have backed up the Brinks truck to Poetan and Prohashka. But definitely Poetan because he is the champion. And the only way you save this card is by having a champion fight. Now. Beyond that fight, they changed the whole card because Jamal Hill decided he wasn't going to fight after his initial opponent, Khalil Roundtree, falls off because of a, a, a dirty piss test. Then he's supposed to fight Anthony Smith, who steps in. 
I was I was excited about that fight. I'm a big Anthony Smith fan. I like Anthony Smith. And I think Anthony Smith would have been a hell of a test for Jamal Hill. And what happens? Jamal Hill falls off. So now Anthony Smith doesn't have a dance. I'm sorry. First it was, what was it? It was Carlos Olberg. My bad. I I apologize. Jamal Hill's supposed to fight Carlos Olberg, who knocks out Alonzo Minifield in 15 seconds a month ago. He comes back, ready to fight again. He's going to fight Jamal Hill. And what happens? Jamal Hill falls off. Who steps in? Anthony Smith on like 10, 12 days notice. 14 days, something like that. Much props to Anthony Smith. And then Carlos Olberg falls off last week. And now you got Anthony Smith fighting Roman Delize. That's a, still a fun fight, but it doesn't have the, the pomp and circumstance. It doesn't have the bang to it. It doesn't have what I really wanted to see with Anthony Smith against Jamal Hill or even Olberg, because Olberg's a banger. Delize is a good fighter. But I think that Anthony Smith is going to win this fight rather convincingly, to say the least. I could be wrong, but yeah, I like I like Lionheart in this fight. Oh, by the way, I, I do like um, Pereira to retain his belt. Then we got Brian Ortega. They added Brian Ortega to this fight card against Diego Lopez. Diego Lopez gave Movsar. Elio, ugh, Evloev, Evloev, a hell of a tough fight that when his first in his introduction to the UFC, he gave him the business, but he came in on short notice and he wasn't in shape enough and ended up losing the fight. However, the much respect to that guy. Now they're the co-main event. Brian Ortega is coming off of that big win over Yair Rodriguez. Now that you see with. Uh, Ilya Taporia, he's going to fight whoever. I don't even know who he's fighting at this point. Is he fighting? I don't remember who he's fighting, to be honest. It doesn't matter. Um, but now that Ortega, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's fighting. He's going to fight Max Holloway more than, I think, is it already? But my fuck, I'll delete this crap. Now that Ilya Taporia is probably fighting Max Holloway, Brian Ortega knows he needs to fight somebody else or he'll be sitting for a while. He takes this fight on short notice. My concern for Ortega is conditioning. Um, that is always a concern with Ortega is, is he in the best, best, best shape? He looked fantastic um, after getting pummeled in the first round. He looked fantastic against Rodriguez and how he finished that fight. That said. I don't, this is a matchup where Lopez really is the one that has a lot to gain and Ortega's got nothing to gain other than a win, other than doing the UFC a solid because you got number three versus number 14. We know rankings in the UFC don't really mean much of shit because if Lopez wins, now Lopez is a top five fighter. However, if Ortega wins, he's still ranked number three behind Volk and, and Max, or Max and Volk, or however, however you have the rankings going on now at this point. But real talk, like it, it, it's one of those fights where Ortega cannot afford to lose. He's the better fighter. He's the more experienced fighter in the UFC, and he cannot afford to lose. So I'm excited to see that fight. I hope Ortega does not allow his face to be used like a punching bag in the first round because he has a, t a tendency to get in these firefights, even though he's a jujitsu fighter. He loves to scrap. He loves to bang. And it doesn't always serve him the best for his you know, potential to win. So I love the fight as a fight that it's going to be, a, I think it'll be a banger. But I like to see, or I think Ortega comes away with the victory. Then you go down this card. I mean, this card overall, it's pretty damn good. I think it's a better card today than it was with Connor and Chandler, quite frankly. You know, you have Ian Machado Gary against Michael Venom Page. Now, this is one of those fights where, you know, 
Gary talks a lot of shit. MVP talks a lot of shit. MVP's a counter, he's a counter puncher, right? He counters everything. This fight is going to happen the way Gary makes it happen. What I mean by that is if he just circles around, it's going to make for a boring ass fight because MVP's not going to chase him. MVP is going to stand there and let him circle. He'll just basically spin around in a pirouette until Gary decides he wants to fight. MVP doesn't chase people. You saw what happened with Kevin Holland, how boring that fight was. That fight was brutal because it was a similar situation. If Holland was completely confused by you know, MVP's ability. Look, MVP is a tough guy. He's a tough fighter. If you wrestle him, he has no chance. He he can't stand, he can't stop a takedown, and that's what happened when he was over in um in Bellator. Uh, he, he can't stop a takedown. Now, it really comes down to Gary. If Gary if, if Gary stands in front of him, we could get one exciting ass explosive firework fights with a potential for a sick finish from one of these guys. That's the question. Does Gary stand and bang with him and stand in front of him? Because if he's circling, MVP's just going to look at him, dance around, talk a little shit, stick his tongue out, maybe try to slap him in the face or something like that, do little pot shots. I'm, I'm curious to see. I'm curious to see. I'm curious to see if Gary decides he wants to wrestle because he looks bigger than, 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 uh, than MVP. You know, he, just, he looks like I'm just a naturally bigger guy. MVP's slim as hell. So we shall see, you know, if uh, Gary is as good as he says he is. I really would have loved to have seen Gary fight Colby Covington. I mean, obviously, Colby Covington has nothing to gain from fighting Gary. But I would have loved to have seen that fight. And I'm a big Colby Covington fan. I put it out there. But I'm a little disappointed that Colby wouldn't take that fight. Because there's not a lot of fights for Colby to take at this point. And that would be a fight to take. Now, if he's not healthy, then I understand it. But all those stipulations he put on Instagram were stupid. They were they were ridiculous. Like turn on your comments, stuff with like I, I'm not with all that stuff. I get it. You're talking shit back and forth. And yeah, there's weird things, some things involving Gary that are, that a lot of men might think are weird, but it's none of my business, none of our business. And, and yes, it's the fight game. But if you're gonna fight someone, fight him. If you're not, move on. Like this stuff, this stuff where you yak, yak, yak on people that you're not going to fight or don't plan to fight, it's silly to me. That said, I would still love to see Colby Covington fight this dude, if he, especially if Gary wins. If Gary wins, I definitely want to see Colby Covington fight this dude because that will be a true test for Ian Gary to see if he's really that guy. Now, MVP, if he pulls off this victory, we're talking about a different stratosphere now. This is in Bellator. This is, he's going to move up into the top seven He's going to have to see some wrestlers. And he can't wrestle. <laughs> Blunt, he cannot wrestle. So he's going to have to see some wrestlers. And we'll find out if he really has that in him to make a run in a title shot. But it's a fun fight if Gary stands and bangs. If he doesn't, it can be, it can make for a snoozer. You have Meyer Bueno, bueno Silva versus Macy Chasson uh, at Bantamweight. It's a big fight for the division. If if Silva wins, does she have a shot to get another title shot? Does she have a shot to get a get a title shot? Um, you know, she's ranked third. It, you know, she lost to Pennington in her last fight, a fight that I thought she would win. She did not fare well. However, if you really ask me who I think is better, I thought I think Silva's better than Pennington. I just thought Silva gassed out so fast in that fight. So a win over Chasson puts her in a, in a position to get another title shot. Possibility. Obviously, after we finally see Pennington fight, um, so we see Pennington fight um, Juliana Pena. And, you know, now Holly Holm is in the pick. I'm not Holly Holm, I'm sorry. Uh, Kayla Harrison is now in the picture as well at 135. So we shall see what happens there. Undercard itself is also pretty darn good. I mean, you have Cub Swanson and Andre Feely in this in this undercard. These guys are a little older. I mean, Cub is a bit older, but 
him and Andre Feely always throw hands. Like, these guys are ready to fight. These guys don't come in and pussyfoot around. So you're going to get a real action-packed contest in that fight. Charles Jordan's on the card fighting Gene Silva. Jordan always brings it uh, from what I've seen. And then you have Peyton Talbot, who's the biggest favorite in this card, at minus 1,600 against Yanis Gamori. I mean, I've seen some funny interviews from Peyton Talbot this week. On the early prelim, though, you have Michelle Waterson, Gomez versus Jillian Robertson. If you gave me this fight four years ago, I might actually be interested. But Michelle Waterson, Gomez, has been losing for quite some time now. Like, I don't remember the last fight that she won. Let's see. Let's look back. She lost to Rod- uh, Rodriguez. She lost to Pinedo. She lost to Lemos. Like, she lost to Rodriguez again. She lost... Her last win was that split decision win over, I think it was a split, over Angela Hill that a lot of people thought she lost. So, you know, that's her last win. Does that, you know, and before that, she lost to Esparza. She lost to Joanna Jajavic. She's literally won one fight in her last seven. Realistically, I don't even know how she's still in the UFC. Like, it's kind of at that point where she's hitting that smiling Sam Alvey, you know, type of losing streak. And if she loses this one, you're talking about she's one in seven in her last eight. How do you keep putting her out there? Cause she's getting her ass kicked pretty much every time she smiles at the end and all that stuff, but she's typically getting her ass kicked. So I was a big fan of hers, but yeah, she's not the same fighter that she was. And she really should be fighting. I mean, what is she? Is she fighting here at a? Is she fighting at fifteen or is she fighting at twenty-five? Yeah, they're fighting at. Uh, I forget. Um. Yeah, she's still fighting at uh, 15. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, Michelle Waterson would have benefited the best from a 105 division because that's where she was really, really good over and Invicta was at 105. 115 is too big for her. Like, it's just too big for her. And it's crazy. You're talking about 115-pound women. It's just too big of a division for her to be successful, especially against these women today. Um, and, yeah, the, the, the I mean, there's a few other fights, but, can you believe Andre Arlovsky is still fighting? Like this guy never goes away. It's unbelievable. He's not. It's like this. Uh, he's lost three straight. Before that, he had won four straight. Before that, he had he lost to Aspinall. He had beaten Bozer. He. Yeah, let's see who did he lose to. He lost to Rosen Strike. He lost. Did he lose to Rothwell? I don't even see where the hell it says it. It's been a minute, man. It's been a minute. Where is the Rothwell thing? Why the heck don't they have a decision on here? It doesn't even say who won the fight. So I don't I don't remember. That was a few years. That was four years. That was five years ago. So no, I don't remember. I'm not looking at Wiki. I'm looking at UFC right now. But he has these streaks of wins and losses. And Andre Arlovsky, I mean, god damn, how old is Andre Arlovsky now? He's gotta be over 40. He's gotta be. He's 45. Lost track of him. He's 45 years old. And the man is still out here banging. Like, one thing you get from Arlovsky, no matter what, he's going to bang. Like, you're not going to get any boring fight from Andre Arlovsky, typically. So, the card overall, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm looking forward to it. Is it a great card? No. But the UFC did a great job in, in piecing it back together to keep interest in it. Because, for a minute, it was looking real. I thought the card before with, with, with Connor and Chandler was a dud overall. But they've really brought it up with these three other fights. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice card. Um, hopefully these guys are all in shape who jumped in late because you have five, six. 
Hell, if you look at the top three fights, all these guys jumped in on like two weeks' notice or less, two, three weeks' notice or less. So I wish to, I, I, I'm looking forward to it. In a disappointing note, uh, Macy Barber is out of her fight versus Rose Namajunas. That really fucking sucks because I thought that was going to be one hell of an exciting fight at 125. Barber's been rolling. Rose just got a win over at, at 125. Ah, man, that, that fight was going to really be for a contender spot because Macy Barber was, was doing some stuff and Rose got her feet wet and, and now was looking like Rose. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of disappointing. I think I've seen reports of uh, Tracy Cortez stepping in for Macy Barber. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if it's confirmed or not yet, but that definitely does not have the the appeal that uh, you know that 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 uh, Tracy Cortez does not have the appeal that the Macy Barber fight with Rose was going to have. Cortez is a good fighter, but she's not Macy Barber. She's nowhere at that level, and I think that uh, it'll be a pretty ni- easy night of work for uh, Rose Namajunas. So that's about it. Um, as you know, we are going to be interviewing fighters uh, and bringing you some new content for Combat Corner. I've, we've already put, put out our first interview. We interviewed King Kai Stewart, the featherweight champion for BKFC. BKFC is up and coming. I mean, Conor is now Conor McGregor is now a part owner. He's, they're doing some big things over there. Just because you love the UFC doesn't mean you can't love other stuff as well. So keep that in mind. Have an open mind to this stuff because the BKFC is exciting as shit. It, they they throw hands and it's not boxing. Like people have to like it's bare knuckle fighting. There's a difference. Like there's a distinct difference because boxers they box. Bare knuckle dudes they are fighting. There's very li- there's a few fights where there's you know boxing like kind of it's kind of a boxing match, but for the most part guys are coming in. Wakata, wakata, wakata. I mean they're coming like rock'em sock'em robot. And when you land in BKFC, it's over. Like, it's really over, over, you know. And there's gra- there's a grappling component to it as well. So don't think that it's just like, you know, what would be pulled apart in boxing does not get pulled apart in BKFC. Give it a chance if you haven't watched it. It's a lot of fun to watch. It's not expensive. They do an annual for like $49.99 to get all their fights on pay-per-view. Give them a shot, man. Forty nine ninety nine to get. I think they give man. They have a fight damn near every week. So if you're not watching, like they have fights damn near every week. They don't have them every week, but you typically have two or three fight cards a month with BKFC. They're already at BKFC sixty three. Next, their next event is six 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 sixty three. They're only five years in. So and they're having more and more and more events. So check them out. We will be having more BKFC fighters that we're interviewing. We will be interviewing some UFC fighters, PFL fighters. Um, but, yeah, that's it for Combat Corner. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow. Ring that bell on our YouTube channel. And definitely be sure to check out um, our Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Come On Now Podcast. And on X at Come On Now Pod. Come on now. Thank you for watching Come On Now, the podcast. Please be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and ring that bell so you get up-to-the-minute updates when we publish new content. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Come On Now Podcast and X and TikTok at Come On Now Pod. Thank you again for supporting this channel.